Right then guys, welcome to your next video and today it's going to be about, um, well if you haven't already guessed because you need to click on the link, it's going to be about uh, circuit design with a view to uh, PCBing. Okay, now um, I'm going to be running through some advice first and in the next video we're going to be doing a little dip trace video, I'm not going to spend too long on that, just give you the basics, run through, but for now all the advice regarding how to go about designing a circuit for a PCB, all the pitfalls, all the tips, and everything that you gotta do. So, first things first. Plan absolutely everything. You can't do anything without planning and knowing what you're going to be doing, okay? Where your circuit's gonna be used, okay? Its location, is it gonna be in the housing? Is it gonna be on the board? Okay, it's going to be a shield or something for you know a device like an Adreno or an MSP430, you know, the launch pads. Um, uh, the actual environment it's going to be in, um, what components that you're going to use. But I'm not, I mean, you're going to have components resistor caps, you know, it's dictated by what sort of you're going to be building, obviously. But what I mean is the actual um, style, whether it's SMD, whether it's through hole, or if it's going to be a mix. Um, yeah, so um, we go through all this sort of stuff. So, first things first, um, getting lost already. Oh, do you have a minute in? Right, um, yeah, so from the top, first thing that you gotta do plan, plan, plan. And that starts off with a let's see, a block diagram or a spider diagram or whatever you want to do, just a sheet of paper. Pen, start whacking down, um, you know, what you want to do. And uh, by that I mean the actual parts of the circuit. So, do you need a power supply? Do you need a, an MCU part? Do you need a keypad? Do you have any inputs, okay? Do you have any, um, you know, uh, any other circuitry to do? Do you have mem uh, memory, sensors, okay? Whack all these down, all blocks, all individual parts okay, into a circuit uh, to build up your overall picture of what you need. That's really important simply because um, it highlights the various areas that you need to work on. So instead of working on the entire board all at once, you can just concentrate on little bits. Uh, a big job can be absolutely daunting. You break it down into you know block diagrams and what have you. It makes life a lot easier, and uh, you can work on it in sections. And you say, right, done that, done that, done that, done that. Just pull it all together. You know, it makes life a lot easier. And this is what planning is all about: making life easy. So that's your block diagram. That's only a very small part. The other side, okay, within that sort of block. So make that block diagram a block, and from there. Decide on where your board's going to be housed. Okay, if it's on a desktop, I'll say it. If it's a breakout board or something like that, or you know, just a demo board, uh, proof of concept, and what have you, you might just want to do a basic board, a few components on it, some rubber feet on the bottom. Brilliant. Whack that down into your design. If it's going to be uh, to go into an enclosure, something like a case or a Face or if it's going to be replacing a board that you've already that's busted and you've got to do a new one, okay, that's a whole different kettle of fish because size is critical, okay. Mounting points are critical, just like we're doing bare boards. Mounting points are critical on bare boards, size isn't critical, okay. It doesn't have to go anywhere, it just sits on your desk, okay. Yeah, just an average size, you know, 10 bar 15, 10 bar 5 board, whatever, okay. If it's going into a case. If it's going into an enclosure, into a case, it's got to be a set size. And you can't really set the size after you've done your design and done your PCB. And so this is all part of your planning, making decisions. And all this boils down to is your design constraints. So you've got your, your block diagram, you've got your idea of all your inputs and outputs that you're going to have on your board. Start breaking down those block diagrams into basic schematics. Again, don't work on the computer, just stick to pen and paper, okay? This is just ideas. You're just, you know, you're just throwing ideas around, 
getting an idea of what components that you're going to need, where it's going to be used, and so on and so forth. So a break down your block diagram, start with your, I don't know, your MCU, okay, you need a clock, list that down in your components, you need your MCU, list that down. Having your block diagram, knowing what you're going to be attaching to it, all your inputs and all your outputs, you can get an idea of how many ports you need for your MCU, okay? So you can get already get an idea of how many pins that you actually need, okay? All your I.O. ports and everything. Brilliant. If you just went off and did the schema, I thought, oh yeah, I'll just use that MCU down there, I'll start doing design. When you come to connecting up your ports and think, oh shit, I need all this stuff, I need A to D's on it, I need comparators on it, oh no, this, I need this, that, and whatever else on it, oh no, I need this, oh, I need watch stop timers and what have you. You may have pulled out the wrong, the wrong MCU, you've already designed, so you've got to do it all over again. So again, it comes back to it. Breaking down your circuit inside block diagrams really does help with component selection and it really does help with design. <clears throat> so start laying out a general schematic. It doesn't have to be fantastic. The main point is, is that you're starting to get an idea of what components you need for each individual section. When you're picking out components, make sure that you can they fit your um, your design constraint of size. If your enclosure is really small, your PCB has to be really small, that means that you're going to have to go to surface mount, okay? Everything that you do has to be small, SMD. If it's a very large case, if it's on desktop board, if it's proof of concept, a mix of both, or just through hole, okay? Just throw through hole at it. What have you got handy? Doesn't matter if it's messy. It's just an idea, proof of concept, get something out, get something done, and then you can go away and, you know, yes, it works, redesign, and you're on to the next phase. So, circuit diagrams, list of components, <clears throat> and so on. So, on your list of design constraints, you've already got things like um, board size to consider, component sizes to consider, whether it's SMD or through hole styles, and so on. Great. Again, back to the enclosures again. They are a big issue when you're designing circuits, okay? If you're going into an enclosure circuit, into a box, not only do you need to know size, you need to know board geometry. So, if you're screwing the top of your board into your, uh, into your case, you need to know where the uh, mounting posts are in your case. In your case, if it doesn't have mounting posts in your case, you might want to add some in they'll have to go to a specific area for your design. Again, another design constraint. Mounting styles, I've already mentioned the, the feet. Okay, if you've got feet, make sure that there's no um, you know, solder joints around by the feet. Make sure that the feet aren't gonna stick over the top of anything. Otherwise, you're not gonna be able to attach them. If they're screw-on feet, make sure that you've got no tracks on the top side. That's actually gonna you know, get shorted out by your screw or your nut or your bolt or whatever it is that you're putting through the top side of the bolt or the bottom side of the bolt, you end up shorting out tracks. So you want to keep everything clear there. More design constraints to go onto the list. And this is all down to mounting styles. If you're putting it into a case and you're using the uh, PC guides that sometimes you get in the enclosures, then maybe you don't give a crap about feet, you don't give a crap about mounting posts. You're not screwing it in, you're going to slide it in. You think, yeah, right, easy. Well, again, how big are, how wide are your um, guides, okay? If they're one millimetre apart, then your PCB has to be one millimetre thick. It's no good going for a cheap 1.5 millimetre general purpose board, you know, a couple of quid per board. You have to go to a specific size. If they're only 0.8 millimeter, then you have to go even lower, and so on. Also, when using guides, it's no good having tracks running um, to close close to the edge of the board. Otherwise, when you slide it in, if it's a tight fit, you can end up damaging your tracks. Don't want to do that. Make sure you leave plenty of room for any uh, mounting points. <sighs> right then, moving on. Um, you've got your, your idea of how you're going to mount your board, you've got an idea of what components you're going to use, you've got an idea of your schematic diagram. From this point, you can start to decide, right, 
Is it going to be a single sided? Is it going to be double sided? You don't know yet. Get your schematic done. Get your components laid out. Take a look at your design and say to yourself, shit, I'm going to have loads of crossing tracks here. I'm going to need a double sided board. Take a look at it. I've only got one or two crossing tracks. Hell, get away with a single sided board. Put in two wire jumpers. Job sorted. I don't need a double sided. Single sided will do. If it's all surface mount, or majority of it's surface mount, you want most of it on the top side. You don't want it on the bottom. Okay, if you're mounting surface mount on the bottom and on the top, it's a complete pain in the ass when you have to do anything like reflow. If you're putting it into an oven to, to um, do any uh, soldering, okay, if you're using an oven. It's no good having components on the bottom side that might move out of position or drop off the board when the top side's perfectly fine. Okay, be careful. So, component placement is important. So, back to pen and paper. Don't do any of this on the computer. Still on pen and paper, get your schematics all out and start doing your PCB layout on paper. Okay, this will highlight the fact whether you're using it single sided or double sided. It doesn't have to be perfect, but paper copies are always brilliant because what comes next is going to be doing it on the computer. So back to our design constraints, we've got our enclosure to think about, board size to think about, board geometry to think about. One thing that I didn't mention, external connectors. Big issue. Loads of people tend to forget about these, okay? Are you going to use bulkhead connectors or chassis mount connectors with flying leads down to your PCB? If you're doing that, how are you going to connect those wires to the PCB? Are you going to hardwire them on, solder them on? In which case, sold, you're going to have the case and the cables and everything all flying everywhere when you're putting this board together. can be a complete pain in the ass. Are you going to connectorize them onto headers? Okay, and which makes life a lot, lot easier. You can solder up the board separately, make up the connects on the case separately, connect them in. Sometimes that's not the case. You can't do that because you've got I know RF inputs and things like that, which have to be impedance matched. Having a flying lead just doesn't cut it. So you have to do something like horizontal or vertical mounted connectors, PCB mounted ones on the board. That means cutouts on your case are critical. Any holes on your case that have to line up with things are critical. Um, if you've got something like, I don't know, a keypad or an LCD panel, they might be board mounted. You slot that into your fascia, cutouts have to be either on the case if you're going in a certain area or if your case already has cutouts okay you have to place those screens precisely on the board okay in a set area and you're stuck there big problem with routing track routing so doing these things on paper highlights these issues lcd panels which if i've got one knocking about here somewhere i did have yesterday Bucket knows where it's gone now. Okay, it's a PCB mounted LCD panel. Okay, so you get to line it up with particular pads on the board. It has to go in a set area so it comes through the front panel and you can actually see what's going on. And all the alignment holes or mounting holes are still match up. So, this is where paper copy comes in handy. So you can start laying out, you can say, right. This is going to be my uh, okay. that's the shape of my board. It's going to have some mounting holes in it. It's going to have mount. It's got a mounting hole there, there, and there. Okay, so we've got some mounting holes. Well, external connectors. Well, well, I can't put them where the mounting holes are going to be, so I'm going to have to put them there. And say. There on the edge of your board, okay. It's no good having mounting, it's no good having external connectivity to the center of the board, otherwise, you're gonna have wires and cable traveling all over your board, and you've got a high probability of noise being propagated from various areas of the circuit into the cable that you're actually inputting your signal with, or you're getting your signal out. You could actually start adding noise into your circuits, into your signals, which you don't want to do. So, keep your connectors to the edge. Like I said, if you've got an LCD panel, you might want to. Yeah, you know, LCD panel at the top. That means that you've only got 
this area to work in to do your circuit so design. So laying out is important, that's what I'm saying. Do it on paper, get an idea of where things go. Um, it gives you a really, really good idea of what space that you do actually have to work in and where you're going to have to be careful rooting tracks and what have you. So, every copy always works. So, like I said, the next phase, getting your schematic done on the computer. That means deciding to use what PCB package to use. Now, there's absolutely millions of them out there. And... Um, They've all got pros and cons. What you need to do is to sift through them all, find out the following when you're deciding what package to use. One, you want to use one which is easy to use for you. Sometimes you have that choice, sometimes you don't have a choice. Because if you've got I don't know, an in house PCB production or you're sending the board out, they might want you to design it in a specific package that they use. So you might not have that option, but always make sure that you. If you can pick the package that you're going to use, make sure it's one that you're comfortable with. Because the last thing that you want to use is to design a board, you're spending on the hours with a program which you find a complete peak to use. Okay, if that's the case, you can almost guarantee that you're going to go tits up somewhere in your design, and it's going to be a case of you can't be asked to work on it for any longer, and you just want to get the job out of the way. It's a, it's a common problem. Um, yeah, so pick one that you're actually comfortable working with. Secondly, make sure it outputs in the right format. Okay, I don't mean, you know, save a PCB, save a netlist, yeah, for up, whatever, big deal. Okay, they all do that. What I mean is the outputs, things like Gerbits, DXFs, NC drills, Echelon, plot files, you know, all these manufacturing, um, outputs they're the ones that matter okay they're the ones that you use to produce your artwork with to produce your pcb like your artwork and they're the ones that you produce your pcb to get the physical thing it's no good designing a package which you absolutely love only to find that it doesn't output gerber and your manufacturing processes uses gerber it's no good designing something you know in say AutoCAD because you learn how to use AutoCAD when AutoCAD isn't a circuit design uh, piece of software so don't expect it to output the bloody the, the files in the correct format for a PCB house to use use a proper program with you know the outputs which you actually require so speak to your external manufacturers speak to your in-house manufacturers before you actually start doing anything they will you know, they'll more than likely specify a program to you which you know, they don't have any problems with using. If you come to me and ask me to make your board, I'll probably say to you, if you've used Eagle, go away, bloody design it in something else because Eagle is completely not a shite. Simply because I can't manufacture from Eagle accurately. For some reason, my software doesn't like the Gerber outputs from Eagle. Design Spark, Dip Trace, out him perfectly fine easy pc perfectly fine but eagle no no go area really there's too many bugs in it and software can't cope other packages can cope with it my one can't so ask them what packages they prefer what outputs they prefer you know don't only say that find out what the minimum and maximum dimensions are for your board Okay, from a schematic point of view, you couldn't really give a monkey's PC point of view, PCB point of view, which is what you'll be doing next after schematic, really important. Find out minimum track widths, minimum spacings, maximum board size, minimum board size, hole diameters, what they can produce, and so on. You know, what's the minimum hole size if you're going to be through hole plating? What's the minimum hole size? If you're not through hole plating, what's the maximum hole size? What's the maximum hole size you can plate? What's the, you know, what's the, how many varied hole sizes can you have to successfully plate a board? Because that really doesn't matter if, it, if you're doing through hole plating. If you're not, then, you know, how many hole sizes can I have? Is there any extra cost involved with having different hole sizes? Hole sizes are a big, 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 big issue. Um, so I'm running away with a PCB stuff. We're still a bloody 
sign on a package, you know, okay? But all these things do dictate what package that you use. Final thing when you're picking a package, check out the libraries, okay? All PTB packages come with a default set of libraries for you to use, component libraries, schematic library and PTB library. Make sure that they do match up, okay? The schematics do match the PTB footprints. Some programs do it really well, some programs do it really badly and they don't actually match up, especially the freeware ones. Um, some of them show you a, a, a package and a schematic, perfectly fine laying out schematic. When you transport into the PCB, you find out that you don't have a footprint for it and you're missing components. Make sure they're all there. So a really, really good library is really, really important. Um, again, pros and cons. They do vary between packages, okay? Some are really good, some are really bad, some are mediocre. It's up to you which one you pick. Um, if it doesn't have your package that you want, it doesn't have your component, doesn't have the footprint, make sure that you design it before you start doing your schematic. Okay, that's very important. Not only will it save you a heap load of time, you've got multiples of that one component, but also if you use it in the future, you've got it in your um, PCB package. You don't have to worry about designing it, it's already there, you've done it once, you don't need to do it again. So it's win 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 all the way around. Always design your component if you don't have it. So then that's your PTB package sorted out. Like I said, we're going to be doing dip trace later on. I do find that package reasonably good. I, I can't fault it. The new uh, freeware version does it is more limited now. Okay, you can only do two layers and there's only a 300 pin count. But for general boards and you know, majority of boards, perfectly fine unless you're going to be doing anything you know if you're going to be producing this thing for production you're going to be selling the item obviously you can't use the freeware one you've got to go to the paid version but that also means that you can do multi-layer you can do more component count bigger board sizes and so on so having one full version really does help i'm actually going to get the full version myself just one off version just in case we need to do bigger boards but generally speaking 300 pin count just for a general one. We're not selling enough of the stuff, it's perfectly fine to use the freeware one. We're not making a profit on the stuff either, so yeah, whatever. Um, yeah, so after your picture package, you've got all your design constraints. Start, kick off your package, start designing the components that you don't have. Once you've done that, Dip trace is very easy to do, I'll show you how to do that. Um, once you've done that, go on to laying out your schematic. Make use of um, what's called ports in dip trace. I think in other packages they call them reference points or nodes. Okay, they're commonly used if you look in lots and lots of schematic diagrams. If I've got one around, yeah, well, this is one that Ben done uh, for me to make. Um, if you can see, we've got our ground symbols up there, down here, down here, and so on. We've got a VCC and what have you dotted about the place. Um, they're uh, reference points. If you use reference points, it saves you having to route a million and one connections all around your schematic and make it look like a complete and utter rat's nest. Okay. If you use ground points, dot, 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 all over, when you transport it into your PCB package, all those points will, all, will be connected up for you for routing. Okay, they'll, be all, they'll all be joined together. Same with VCC. If you put in any other nodes and wave or any other reference points, generic ones or general ones or ones that you can make yourself, okay, they'll all be joined together. So it really, really does help and it really does tidy up your schematic quite a lot. Some packages also use things like bus bars. So if you've got, say, 30 or 40 lines all coming from, I don't know, one MCU to another one, because you're parallel processing or something like that. Um, you may want to use bus bars. That's something further on. They're very similar to reference points. It's all worth combining all those connections all down into one line kind of thing. So you can see them all coming in. They'll go into one connection. And you see them all coming out again in the opposite side. It's a way of neating up your um, circuit diagram you've got an absolutely shitload of connections and on schematic the more connections that you've got the messier it looks the harder it is to route things around 
they time hard to spot errors. This is where your paper copy also comes in because as you do your piece, your um, schematic in software, mark off on the paper the connection that you just made. That way you can compare the two and you can see if you've missed out any connections or you've added the wrong connection in. I accidentally did this to this one. This is a really, really simple one, you know, it's only what, three, four components and a couple of tracks. I connected one up to the wrong bloody pin the first time around when I first started designing that. It was only when I double checked that I actually saw it. So having the paper copy does give you the option to double check your work, reduces the amount of errors in your when you're producing the board. If I didn't spot that because it just went straight from idea to design producing PCB, I'd have a PCB whacked down in front of me that I'd connect together, I could have burnt out whatever I was whatever was being done with it because I made the wrong connections. So again, paper copy to the screen, mark it off as you're done, does reduce errors and does save you time. Seems a bit of a, an awkward thing to do because you're doing it twice, but it really does help. Right, you've got your schematic all laid out, perfectly fine, thumbs up. Transport that over into the PCB side of things now. Now this is where uh, things start to get that little bit messy first of all. Because when you first import, you're going to have a complete rat's nest generally on the screen. All your components will be over the top of each other, all wire connections all connected together. It's going to be just dumped there in a complete and utter mess. You have to try and untangle it. So. This where it comes back to your paper copy, your generic PCB layout. First up, do the board, okay, board outline first. Make it to the right shape, your board geometry and your design constraints, you've already got it noted down. You know what size it has to be, no pissing about. That's the first thing that you do. Why? If you lay out a circuit, it can be Right, so circuit this big, okay, on the screen, looks wonderful, looks nice, no problems with it. Trouble is, when you do your board outline, it has to be that big. It's no good your design being that big, so you've got a shitload of work to do to try and press it down. Pain in the arse. Do your board outline first. Again, once you've done your board outline, do your mounting holes next. Very important. It's no good having a board outline, making sure all your components fit into that. Only to find when you do the bloody mounting holes that you've got tracks crossing them or you've got components in the way and it becomes a complete peak to rework your design once it's already there on the screen. Again, pain in the arse. Board outline, mounting points first. Once you've done that, get your external connectivity on there your BNC ports, your SMA connectors, your BNC connectors, your LCD panels, your keypads, stuff like that. Things which have to be in a specific place. Okay. Get those down next because they are your design constraints. You can't get away from them. They have to be there. They have to be in a specific place. You can't shift them about. There's no room for error. Components on the other hand can be orientated this can be orientated horizontal vertical um, your chips can be done horizontal vertical shifted about the, the board slightly the tracks can be routed top to bottom not a problem connectivity wise you're stuck with it board size you're stuck with it get those things down first so it's a lot of messing about once that's done you can start to place your components onto the board now then back to the block diagram important thing. If you've got a power supply that you built into your board, make sure it's in separate place away from your digital or your analog. Okay, very important. Power supplies generate a shitload of noise. If it isn't screened, if it's open, if it's not encased, if it's not separate, if it's not on a separate board, it's all on the same board. Keep it separate and take out lines. Make sure you do a ground plane around it and underneath it. Next up again, Digital, make sure your digital is well away from any noisy areas. Obvious, but keep it close to whatever you need your digital for. It might be your LCD screen, which means that in your digital area might have to be near your power supply, it might have to be near your analog. 
there may not be any getting away from it. So you have to be careful of where you're rooting your tracks, okay? So if you've got excessive parallel lines, you're gonna get parasitic capacitance across them if it's long runs. So shorten up your runs of um, you know data lines, analog, your power rounds, stuff like that. Keep them away from your data lines. Keep it away from any sensitive area. If you've got um, any SMAs connected to high frequency RF devices and what have you, maybe going up to an antenna, you can have to shield around the area quite a lot, which means that you can't root any component, any tracks there. You can't place any components there. You've got to keep them away. But again, all constraints. Be careful. Lay your board out logically according to your block diagram in blocks, but you know, you're gonna have to blur the uh, you know the edges a little bit, okay? The borders blur a little bit. There is some crossover, but try and avoid it if you can. <clears throat> Once you've got all your board laid out, you're happy with it. A word on tracks, wires and everything before you start doing your PCB in. Okay, I should have said this first, but I got carried away. Set your defaults, okay? Default track widths, default spacings, um, track to board separation, pad to board separation, the track to track, track to pad, you know, all this sort of stuff. Set it up first, get your design rules done. There's a section in most um, PCB packages, okay? which says things like either design rules or spacings or um, routing layers, uh, design layers, things like that, all this kind of wording, go into them. They'll all be under preferences or under tools or under edit options, things like that. Make sure that you do set all the default values before you start routing stuff about, like especially tracks and pads. Because if you put down the primary value first that it can be working to, you can specify things like power lines, nets, uh, the particular net is a power line, it's going to be this particular thickness, so when you start rooting your tracks about, they are that thickness. If you don't do that, it's going to default to the basic, usually a couple of points of a millimetre, which sometimes is absolutely crap for the power side of things. Might be perfectly fine for any digital runs, but completely crap for any power, completely crap for any RF, com might be completely crap for your analog side. So, Set all your values first, your default values. Some programs only let you set one default value for track width. That'll be a primary one that you use that you use. So take a look at your design. What's the primary area? Is it prim predominantly analog? Is it predominant digital? Is it predominantly RF? Set your thicknesses accordingly. Vires and holes. Make sure you don't use the default one. Generally they'll be Piss small hole on a piss small pad. Not many people will be able to drill that size of hole that you need for vines or for pads. Make sure that they conform to the size of drill bits that your, your manufacturer has. Because you've got three options. One, they'll use nearest preferred size. That could be a bigger drill bit to the size of hole that you wanted, which might remove the pad. It could be a smaller drill bit to your hole size that they don't have. So they may drill it smaller, which means your component doesn't bloody well fit, especially if you're through hole plating. It might close up the hole just that little bit too much and your component doesn't fit through. Or they don't bloody drill the hole at all and you're left with pads which are undrilled. So make sure that you do conform to what your manufacturer specifies for hole sizes. They are critical. You don't want to end up with holes which are too big which you drilled out of the pad you've got nothing to bloody solder to. You don't want a hole that's too small that you can't that you can solder to it perfectly fine but you can't fit the bloody component in. And having drill holes which aren't even drilled and they're meant to be drilled and plated is a complete pain in the ass because you have to drill them out yourself and then end up having to solder top and bottom side. Complete rat's ass of a mess to get into if it's a component that you can only solder at bottom side and it's you needed it through hold to the top side complete pain in the arse to deal with. So, hole sizes, uh, minimums and maximums, conform to them before you start designing anything out in the PCB. Final thing, once you've got your board done, everything's laid out. Okay, 
double check it to your bloody PCB layout that you've done on paper and your schematic. Make sure nothing's missing, make sure you've got all the components where they're meant to go, make sure the tracks run where they're meant to go. You can do net highlighting, it does help when you're following a path on big, big designs. It can also help you if you're just starting out and it's a small design. Just tick off what you've done. And again, double check everything. Once you're happy, do a paper print. Get it printed out, cut the board out to the edge. Slap it on the desk and say to myself, and say to yourself, this is what I'm going to get. Right, do my components fit this? Get your components and make sure they fit to the pads. If they don't, you've done the cock up, redesign. If they do, brilliant thumbs up. Take that bit of paper, make sure it fits into your case, or your feet fit onto it, or a mounting post or whatever. Make sure it, everything aligns up, okay? If it doesn't, you're going to have to do that redesigning again. Thumbs up all the way for that, if it goes according to the plan. If not, you know, it's a little bit more work. But the main thing is, you haven't produced anything yet. You're still in the software side of things, you're still in the design side of things. You haven't wasted any money producing a board, which you're going to have to throw away. If you're working in industry, that costs your boss money. That's going to give you a bad reputation. If you're doing it yourself, if it's a startup company, your you know expenditure is really really important. Startup companies, pennies matter. Um, yourself, if you're doing it yourself, your home project, and you get it sent out. This is your own money that you could be wasting. So make sure that the design is perfect before you send it off to be made. And if you send it off in house, and there's a problem with your design. Uh, they could send it back to you, okay? They could turn around and say, look, you've got a problem with it. Brilliant. It gives you the option to sort out if you send, but if you send it out to um, an external company, that usually, you know, there's no guarantee that they'll actually highlight that you've got a problem. They could actually make the board and, um, yeah, wasted board. So, um, yeah, just be careful of what you're um, sending out, your final design. Just double check all the things, make sure it's all perfect. Because as I say to everyone, where regarding circuit design, whatever you're doing PCBs, what you see is what you get. If it looks wrong, if it looks like they've cocked something up, it looks like that you've made a complete utter mess. Okay, if you can't follow it, your own design, if you can't work out what your own design is meant to do on the board, don't get it made. Start again, just work your way through it, take your time, don't brush things. So leaving you there um, I'll run you through dip trace we'll do a schematic we'll do a we'll import into PCB packet into the PCB side of dip trace do the PCB in the component placement the board outline routing of tracks and so on I'll speak a little bit about mitre and filleting and so on why that's the case and um, we'll, I'll show you how to output your design for uh, producing it. So, see you next time.